while we have to wait for the Honorable Minister of State for Health and Family Welfare, Srimati Anupriya Patelji, I would request Dr. Silva Murthy, sir, to address the audience. Very good afternoon to all of you. Honorable former President, Dr. Ashok K. Chauhan, the Chairman of the University of Uttar Pradesh, Dr. Asif Chauhan, Dr. Linda, the Director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and very distinguished people on the dais, of the dais, and the distinguished delegates. very distinguished, wonderful gathering of intellectuals sitting in this campus to deliberate on a very important theme, impact of environment on women's health. Our honorable chief guest, Sri Srimati Anupriya Patelji, honorable minister of state for health and family welfare. She has a very busy schedule, so she's on the way. She is about half an hour from now. So like in any sports, you know, you have a warm up. So we are going to have a warm session till the regular inaugural program starts. So I thought I'd tell you something about your host institution and also how important research and innovation in this particular field is. The Amity University today, under the envisioned the initiative of uh, Dr. Ashok K. Chauha, founder president of Amity Group of Educational Institutions, which has assumed a global brand today. It has now nine campuses in India, nine independent state approved universities in India. And you are seeing one of the smallest campus, the baby campus here. But much, the other campuses are much bigger. So we have uh, nine independent state council uh, legislative assembly approved at the state act established university. Then we have 12 campuses abroad, and we including the latest one is US and where we have 170 acres in Long Island facing the Atlantic Ocean. And we also have schools, about 25 schools, including five preparatory schools. So Amity has right from a free nursery to a postdoc, the whole chain of education institutions. So you are coming here is going to be a big synergy and intellectual input for the growth of Amity, who is rendering a human service to the society through education, research, and innovation. Education, even in our curriculum, we have embedded the research and innovation as the forerunner, the common denominator in all the educational design of our curriculum, pedagogy, delivery. Amity has made the concept that it should be research and innovation based so that the creativity, innovation, and also the problem-solving ability is given to our students who are going to be the two-step global citizens. So that is why the research and innovation has been uh, the focus in all of our educational institutions, including schools. We have projects where we have our school students, Amity school students have won NASA uh, Research Prize, the first prize, which was conducted at the global level for habitation of uh, the North Mars. So we have brilliant schools where again research and innovation is getting important. Because ultimately if you need to find a solution and if you have to add wealth to the nation and address the needs of the people at the bottom of the pyramid, it is only through research and innovation. So that is why the Amity institutions have made the focus and all of the chancellors, like including Dr. Atit Chauhan, Dr. Atut Chauhan, and everyone is now spearheading the research as a uh, mission, the research and innovation as a mission in all of our campuses. So in that direction that your presence here is going to make a, a significant input for global community, just not only to Amity, but global community who is attending here. So the theme which you are going to uh, discuss, deliberate for the next couple of days, is going to be on a wonderful area that which all is a concern of all of us at the global level is the impact of the environment on the landscape. Now coming back to research and innovation in Amity, we have uh, uh, filed about 880 patents, 880 patents in the last about seven years. 
So we have been filing a little more than 100 patents a year, which is a good indicator that the innovations are coming out and many of them are now getting granted. And then we are translating these patents into products, technologies, processes, and also the knowledge advancement in a very high impact knowledge advancement. So the deliverables coming out of the research and innovation initiative from Amici is primarily is a product, technology, processes are a very significant path breaking scientific advancement. Some of the glimpses I thought I'll give you that we have a funded projects coming from both India and abroad. We have USA projects, we have projects from NIH, we have projects from Wellcome Trust, and we also have projects from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and many others from uh, the global level. But we also have Indian projects coming from our own Department of Science and Technology, Department of Biotechnology, Indian Council of Medical Research, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and so on. We have formally signed Memorandum of Understanding with for all of our Amici students to work with ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research, which is very, very the epic science and technology organization in our country for the health related in India. So we have a formal MOU. Similarly, in agriculture, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and many more, environment and forests, and the DRD World Defense Research, and many other organizations, we have a very close tie up with them. So we have this synergy coming in. So what we are now looking uh, from this meeting in this particular area on the environment, Amiti has got tremendous strength. We are monitoring the environment by putting the sensors at the rooftop of many of our university campuses. So it's an online monitoring that is taking place. And we have hardcore research being done on the impact of the environment on the bio biosphere, including plant, animal, as well as human. So that is why. The, the conference was when Dr. Kumar Rahman mentioned about this, founder president Dr. Chauhan immediately uh, jumped on this idea and then we are here to have a, a congregation of all the intellectuals who are going to bring out path-breaking out-of-box solutions in the field of women's care. To mention some of the innovations, the Amity has focused on cost-effective solutions. The research can be for uh, blue sky research, and it can be leading to your publications. But our Amity has focused on frugal innovation, a cost-effective solution, so that the benefit of this research will go to a large cross-section of over 7 billion people. Like, I'll give us some a tip of the iceberg. I'll just show it to you, a few glimpses. But Amity has developed a root endophyte, which is known as Piripharma Cora Indica, which gives protection against the air biotic stress like hot temperature, cold temperature, salinity of the soil, alternity of the soil, and also if, if you have to grow something in Ladakh in high altitude in sub-zero temperature, we have found the method by using this micro, which is known as Piripharma for Amica, we will be able to increase the agriculture productivity. So we have tried on cereals, pulses, horticulture produce, medicinal plants, sugarcane, many, many crops. So it has been very successful in, in improving the yield, increasing the yield. So now that has gone to industry, global industry. A Taiwan-based company has taken this account for commercialization abroad, particularly in Taiwan. And we also are giving to Indian industry we have given, and we are now looking for global uh, partnerships to propagate it across the globe. Then we have developed a solution for water. When we are talking about the environment, water, the water, portable water is a big challenge, not only in India, but many developing third world. So how do you give a portable drinking water to people, particularly who cannot afford a water bottle like this, which is there on the diet and also the use? So when you go to villages, they have to drink water from the well, or they have to drink water from the hand pump or whatever water body is available there. So how do we protect them from the microbial contamination? So we have developed a simple device, Amity has developed a simple device, which is just take the prevalence of that region and greater porosity is given by Yechi, he is uh, giving the porosity, impregnated with silver nanoparticles into those pores. Then we put it in a container so you just keep dipping it in the water which you want to drink, whatever from source you have got that. The water gets purified of the microbial contamination. 
So this is going to be a global product because you need this water everywhere. Then they have not only converted as a portable system which you can carry to the pocket and wherever you go you can use it for microbial metabolism, purification. But we will also use it at home. So they have prepared another version for home-based version which can also be used by uh, the people at home, in villages particularly. Another one we have developed is an application of photovoltaic, very, very good innovation which Honorable Prime Minister of India has chosen that as a technology to, to be propagated at uh, the national level, is the agri -voltaic. The agriculture land, India has got many marginal and also small and marginal farmers, which are large numbers, 90% of our farmers will have one acre, two acre, one hectare, two hectare land. So how do you give him the economy, you know, economic development for the small farmer? Accidentally, due to the weather conditions, or to flood, sometimes they lose the crops. So how do you give him the livelihood? So being a Tata Fair, very improvised innovation from Aditi, which has been chosen by Prime Minister's office, which is agri The same agriculture land, you cultivate the crop on the ground, and then above the ground, you have raised the pole and put the photovoltaic in the planted position. And then the shadow will not affect because you have raised the platform and the sun is not static, it keeps moving to the of the crop. Then two things affect the efficiency of the photovoltaic. The first one is the heating up. The bottom gets heated up. The photovoltaic bottom gets heated up and the sun is very hot. So that reduces efficiency. The second factor is the dust which settles down on the surface of the photovoltaic reduces the efficiency. So we have taken care of these two aspects. That once you put it in the crop in the field, the transpiration of the plant, the humidity and the vapor, water vapor, cools down the base like a heat sink. So it takes away the heat. And we have put sprinklers on the top of the surface of the photovoltaic on the top. So when you switch on the motor, which is operated by the energy generated by the photovoltaic, it just cleanses those, uh, the dust, so ultimately that water goes and irrigates the plant as well, plants as well, crop. So you see how we have innovated, then we have optimized the initial spacing of the photovoltaic, then we did a techno economy. That even Portman has got about one acre, a point five acre, how much energy he can generate, besides the crops on the ground. He, he thought, uh, 0.25 acres, he can put about 40 of this photovoltaic on the board. And then each one gives about 300 watts, so he generates 12 kilowatts. So this two, uh, 12 kilowatts, 2 kilowatts he can use it to run the pump, other appliances, those hut or a house to be electrified. And then ultimately 10, 10 kilowatts goes into the grid. Thereby he gets a regular income. You see this simple innovation. So the farmer will not commit suicide. You know, some of, sometimes in our country the farmers commit suicide extreme uh, we have farmed. But we will be able to circumvent and alleviate, mitigate such kind of problem. So this is the analogy. Then we also developed a, a sensor. We have a very great strength in sensor. We have put the standalone sensor, for example, liquid petroleum gas. We use it at home in our uh, kitchen. Right. Right. So it, uh, we have such innovations. I have just given a glimpse, and I'm sure you'll have an opportunity. We would like to show you around our laboratory. Please, please do visit wherever you are in Amiti, whichever country where we have Amiti. You would like to show what we are doing. It's a great pleasure <coughs> that we were able to introduce some highlights of innovation. Thank you very much. I just told him that the Murti that had a prescription to ask why they are waiting for the Honorable Minister. He just stood up and start speaking. I don't think anywhere else one has so much in his mind, body and soul as Dr. Murti has research, innovation, publication, patent, federal project. Everything is in his mind, body and soul. You have seen it, how it's composed his work. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. We feel immensely privileged to have the gracious presence of Honorable Chairman, Amity University, Lucknow Campus, 
Chancellor Amit University, Rajasthan, our highly versatile and dynamic leader and mentor, Dr. Asim Chauhan. May I request her, please address the August gathering. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you to this very important international conference on impact of environment on women's health. I do not think it is possible to imagine such a galaxy of scientists, of thought leaders, of experts from all around the world to come to our city of Lucknow and to deliberate a topic which has so much relevance in every aspect in today's context. India is a country on the move. Wherever you see, we have the potential for development. Changes are happening everywhere you see, and with a very decisive leadership in the central government, there is a great promise for growth in every aspect and sphere of our economy, in our politics, in our social life. But with growth, difficult questions, tough questions have to be asked. What compromises are we willing to make to attain this growth? What sacrifices do we have to make to reach the growth targets that we have set for ourselves? And one of the very big questions, of course, that we debate in India and in many other countries around the world every day is around environment and what do we do about the major problems that we are facing in relation to pollution in every aspect and in many other environmental problems that we face today. What is the impact of it? And particularly, what is the impact on the most vulnerable? What is the impact on our children? And as a father, when I see the pollution levels in Delhi where we live, I get very concerned. And I worry about what solutions can we find very quickly to these major problems that we face. Also women, I think it is very, very important to talk about this issue because when a woman does well, she can impact the whole family. So many people are dependent on a woman and if a woman falls ill, so many people suffer because of that. And it is an underrepresented problem. So I think today's gathering in which we are talking about particularly the impact on women is absolutely essential. I do not think that we could have a better representation on our diet than we have today of strong women visionaries than we have here today. We will soon be expecting Ms. Anupriya Patel, the Honorable Minister of, uh, Minister of State for Health and Family Welfare. Uh, she will be hearing from her. She is one of our youngest and most dynamic ministers and one of our most brilliant ministers also. When I say it, I say it because we have some inside knowledge because she happens to be an Amity alumni also. And maybe one of our greatest alumni. Not only is she an alumni, but she has also been a teacher at Amity. She has taught psychology at the university. And when the feminists can become leaders and be part of governance, I think the world will be a better place. I'm looking forward to her arrival as I'm sure all of us are. Earlier today, I told someone as I was coming towards Lucknow that today there is a great woman from America in India. She is a great visionary, she is a great achiever, and today she will be talking about women's issues. And the person said to me, yes, Ivanka Trump is here. I said, no, I'm talking about Dr. Linda Bernbaum because she is no less than what she has done. She is a national leader of environment health science. Her vision, her dynamism, her result-oriented nature. I've been hearing about all this for Professor Kamar Rahman. We have been waiting with bated breath for more than one year that Dr. Linda Bernbaum will come and we were really so hopeful that she would come and we have come and we are so happy. Yesterday, um, I got a call from Professor Kamar Rahman that the flight of Dr. Bernbaum was delayed getting into Delhi and she has missed the connection to Lucknow. It was late at night. She must have been tired from a long trip from North Carolina or Washington to first uh, uh, Delhi and then she had to fly on. And then she had to stay in Delhi for the night on last moment's notice. 
and then fly at the, on a 5.20 a.m. flight to Lucknow. She was, I could imagine she was smiling, she was positive. She said, no problem, this happens, but I'm looking forward to being in Lucknow. So I think this is the positive attitude which we have here, and a good example of what we have here. Accompanying Dr. Bernard from all over the world, we have truly a list of scientists and experts, which to me is mind-boggling. When we first started this campus in Lucknow, and if someone asked me on that day in 2003 to close my eyes, and say, what would you wish for this campus? What would you wish for this university? I would have said, let there be people like this list of people that we have here come to this university. Along with Dr. Linda, we have Dr. John Balbus here. He is the co-chair of this conference. Dr. Balbus, we welcome you. We have Dr. Shrita Naradu, also here, who has also received an honorary professorship uh, from Amateur University Haryana in Gurgaon. When, sir, you were an embassy fellow of the United States Embassy in Delhi, it's wonderful to have you here. We have from Columbia University, I can call him my friend, Professor Tom Hyde. When I visited his Center for Radiological Research at Columbia University in New York, I found in him not only to be a great scientist, but a great human being. And he personally gave me a long presentation about all the research activities. He made a cup of tea for me, and I was so touched by that warmth and personal touch Dr. Hyde, we welcome you, and along with you, Dr. Regina Santella, Dr. Mary Beth Terry, Dr. Jasmine McDonald, all from Columbia. We welcome all of you. We have with us from NYU, Professor Judith Zelikov. We have from Harvard, Dr. Francine Layden. We have from Drexel University, my friend Dr. Arthur Frank, who uh, I had a very enjoyable cup of tea with. And we talked about pollution in India and what pollution can be. And with Dr. Frank, we have Jennifer Taylor and Jane Furth. From Germany, the country where I uh, was born and grew up, we have a wonderful delegation from the University of Rostock, led by no one less than the Chancellor himself, Prof, uh, Dr. Wolfgang Scharek. And along with him, we have Dr. Wolkenhauer, we have Professor Langer, and we have Professor Reisinger. And quite as old as he hears them, and feel as he hears them. We have Professor Mollet Zaidi here, who is a great scientist from Mount Sinai, but who has his roots and his home right here in Lucknow. He was born here and has become a proud son of the soil of Lucknow. We have Dr. Dominic Jacksonville here, who is a legal advisor to the Senate of Belgium. We welcome you here. The list goes on and on, and there are so many people to address, but just as a representation, here are a few of the names who I'm delighted to see here. Uh, I was thinking, what kind of person does it take to gather these kind of people? It must take an amazing, superhuman person. And that person is Professor Kamar Rehman. <laughs> because we know that all the scientists that have gathered from all over the world, all over the country, are here because of the scientific respect and love and affection of Professor Kamar Rehman. Each of the names we've been hearing about for years. And I think this gathering, Professor Rehman, is like a gathering of your extended family, as well as a conference, scientific conference. And I think it's a very special day for you and for Amity through you. Apart from the Indian, apart from the international delegation, we of course have incredible talent from scientific spheres from all over the country. And I'm so proud to see the kind of people that are here from top labs of India, from uh, universities and institutes all over the country. We have uh, Dr. Alok Bhavan here, who heads up one of the most uh, renowned labs in Lucknow and the country, IITR, the Indian Institute of Toxicological Research. Dr. Bhavan, we are so happy that you are here. And one of our godfathers, Dr. Nityanand is here. You must take note of that. He is uh, one of the people when the history of science in Lucknow is written, his name will be there in gold letters. And he has not only been uh, a guiding light for science, that's no idea. He has also been one of the mentors for Amity from day one. I have been seeing him as a young child with Dr. Sohan, and he would dream what Amity be, will be one day when we had maybe only one campus and a few hundred students at that time. Professor Nityan, and I'm so happy that you are here, and I'm so grateful. From our own Amity University, we have delegates here, and I'm so proud 
that from Amp universities in Noida, in Manister, Raipur, Kolkata, Jaipur, Gwalior, that our young scientists, PhD scholars, have come to be part of this. You have a lot to learn. I welcome all of you to your own Lucknow University and Lucknow campus. And nothing can happen at Amity without the blessings and the guidance of our founder president, Dr. Ashok Chauhan. <laughs> Dr. Chauhan went on a gov government scholarship from India to West Germany for his higher education. He went there with two pounds sterling in his pocket. That is all that his father could afford to give him. He went there with the vision that I will go and take the Indian name around the world and I will work very hard and create something big and different. He became the head of an R&D institution, Deck by the, and then decided to open his own enterprise, becoming one of the biggest industrialists, entrepreneurs on continental Europe and maybe all of Europe building a multi-billion dollar empire. But in his heart and in his mind, it was always, what can I do for India? What can I contribute to India for national and social development? And he felt it is only through education, research, training, science and technology that the nation can develop. And he founded a movement called Amity with a few people beside him. Many of the people here have been with us for many, many years, and together the Amity platform has been built, and it will only grow because of collaborations and friendships like the people that are here today. So Dr. Johan, we thank you for having given us this platform <laughs> and having really invited all of us to uh, be on this mission that Amity is trying to fulfill. Along with the founder president, we have his co pillar Dr. Silva Murthy is here. Dr. Silva Murthy is the president of the Amity Science Technology uh, and Innovation Foundation, one of the four Amity arms, which is connecting all of our institutions globally and finding clusters of research and finding an impetus how we can motivate a brilliant young scientist and scholar to achieve more and more. Sir Murthy, we're so happy that you are guiding today's activity. I'm so happy that my younger brother Amol is here. Amol uh, graduated from Harvard University and was in Deutsche Bank for many years. And Dr. Sahan just uh, yesterday said, Amol, can you accompany us to Lucknow? You will see great people there. And he immediately said, yes, I will be there. I've seen the list of scientists and I would very much like to be there. Amol, thank you for coming. <laughs> I just uh, pay gratitude to the organizers. Yeah. You have all worked very hard with the leadership of Professor Kamar Rahman, but the leadership at the campus here, which is led so ably by one of the best administrators we have at Amity, Mirjel and KPO. Jenori's wife, Mrs. Ori, is also here with Nirmal Ori, and she has a complaint of Jenori. She <laughs> says that you speak on the phone with Dr. Asim Kahan more than you speak to me. <laughs> Ma'am, I apologize to you today. You are right. Jenori and I speak several times a day. Jenori, we appreciate your leadership of this campus. You have built a wonderful institution here, and along with your team, all the organizing committee's name, I will only name one. Dr. Farhad Jaffrey is here to my right. You worked very hard for this one because I appreciate you and all the people who have been here. I would also just like to say that all the people that have come from near and far, you have done a wonderful thing for us by being here. And in return, we give you the pledge and the promise that the time that you gave to us and the ideas that you give to us here, we will work day and night to see that fruitful outcomes come out of it in terms of implementable ideas, policy changes that will have an impact on Lucknow, on Uttar Pradesh, on India, and on this region. Because in this part of the world, we need ideas. We have a lot of people, but with the right ideas, we are happy to implement, we are willing to implement, and the outcomes that will come from it, I think, will be tremendous. As, um, as a small first step, we will be taking a few initiatives to launch a few centers. So we will be announcing a center for international bioinformatics and Professor Olaf Wolkenhauer, where is Professor Wolkenhauer? He will be, uh, he will be speaking about this center, which ah. is very interesting. We will be announcing the launch of a center, uh, International Center on Women's Health Issues, and Dr. Nikolopoulos Tamaki from the University of Athens, Greece, will be talking about this center 
later on. Dr. Nikolopoulos Kamati, are you here? Yes. Dr. Uh, Kamati, we welcome you. So nice and wonderful that you are helping and build this center together with Amity. We will sign an MOU with Louisiana University. And Dr. Ramit Kuduru is here. Kuduru, we welcome you and thank you for signing this MOU with us today. And from Louisiana, we also have the daughter of Professor Kamal Rahman, Dr. Farah Khan, who is also here from another university in Louisiana. We welcome you. With uh, these few words, uh, I will say once again thank you very much to all of you for being here. I welcome you. It is so nice to be with you here. We look forward to spending time with you. Uh, I would have to apologize that uh, later on tonight, whereas many of you are from the U.S., I have to catch a late night flight to the U.S. because we have some uh, pressing meetings. As you heard from Dr. Selva Murthy, we have acquired 178 campus in New York where we will be establishing something called the Amity Global Research Hub, which will be a mandate to connect researchers from all over the world with top researchers like yourselves in the United States. And the architectural plans are just about ready. We have a whole group, a committee that will be working on it. We'll be inviting many of you to give your ideas for that also. Because we believe that it is only through collaboration that we can find the solutions to tomorrow's problems. And you're all part of this, you're all part of the Amity family. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for that motivational, inspiring, and thought-provoking address. It's an honor to have you with us today. May I now have the pleasure and privilege of introducing Professor Dr. Linda Bernbaum. Before I request her to deliver the keynote address, Dr. Linda is director at National Institute of Environmental and Health Sciences and National Toxicology Program at USA. She is a highly distinguished scientist, having more than 300 research papers published in highly reputed international journals, and has more than 300 books, chapters, and books published through her career. She has been recipient of numerous awards for her extraordinary contribution in the area of research. To name a few, National Research Service Award, National Wildlife Federation Special Edition National Conservation Achievement Award, First Elbow Memorial Award, Karolinska Institute Sweden, Scientific and Technological Achievement Award, Environmental Science and Technology Excellence in Review, National Institute of Health Directors Award, National Research Center for Women 2012 Health Policy Year Award. And we are honored to have you here. Can we have a huge round of applause for Dr. Linda Bandra? I request her to deliver the keynote of that. Thank you very much. It, it's truly a pleasure for me. I love coming to India because it's my first opportunity to be in Lucknow, which is very, very, very special. So if we can have a slide, but I'd like to get going quickly because it looks like on the program I had less time than I thought I was going to have. So the slides are coming. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, what I really wanted to tell you about first is very briefly. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Institute of the National Institute of Health, let me go to the next slide. I guess I don't control them. I see you need to go to the next one. Ah, perfect. Thank you. I see where I pointed. Where do I point it? Uh -huh. There we go. So the National Institute of Health is the largest funder of biomedical research, um, I think, in the world, not only in the United States, but it has a budget um, in 2017 of about $34 billion U.S. dollars a year, and its focus is funding on basic biomedical research. NIH has 27 institutes and centers, of which 26 are located in, um, in uh, just outside of Washington and Bethesda, Maryland. But the National Institute of Environmental Health Center is actually located in what we call the southern part of heaven, or North Carolina. Um, we were set, established there over 50 years ago as a payback from um, John F. Kennedy to the governor of North Carolina for delivering North Carolina to the Democratic um, slave at that point in time, which was a big deal. We are like any NIH institute. We do have a very vigorous 
intramural research program that focuses on basic biomedical research. We have most of our money goes out to grants that fund um, um, scientists in over 39 U.S. states and 35 foreign countries. And in addition, though, we have some special programs like the National Toxicology Program, which actually involves not only the National Institutes of Environmental Health, but also involves the Food and Drug Administration and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. But unlike many of the other NIH institutes, we really have a focus on prevention and public health as well. So what do I mean when I say the environment? The environment is pretty broadly defined. It is not only focused just on chemicals in the environment or the air pollution that we're all dealing with or water pollution. It also includes things like the food that we eat. It includes um, the, the, the psychosocial activities that we have, things like stress, things like lifestyle, such as drinking of alcohol, smoking of cigarettes. It includes things like infectious agents, because we understand now that if you are exposed to certain kinds of chemicals, including air pollution, it impacts your ability to fight off infectious agents, and it also impacts your ability, for example, to be vaccinated against certain diseases. So there are many, many different things that we consider when we consider the environment. What we have to begin to understand is worldwide, there is a shift in what the major causes of disease while well, much of the focus has been traditionally on infectious agents, and part of that is we can do something, usually about infectious agents. We can develop vaccines, we can improve sanitation. But we now know that not only in the more developed world, but also in low and middle in income countries, chronic non-communicable diseases, things like cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, a heart disease, um, as well as effects on our children, such as an increase in autism spectrum disorder, an increase in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Many of these things, which are not related to infectious agents, in fact, are now the largest cause, both in the developed world and in the developing world, for both death and mortality. Death and morbidity, excuse me. Just a month ago, on October 19th, the Lancet had a commission on pollution and health, which reported that pollution is related for at least 9 million deaths, at least, and that's really a minimum, a year, and that most of these are occurring in developing countries. The welfare losses due to the pollution are estimated to amount to over $4.5 trillion a year, and that chemical pollution and human health are very poorly defined and almost certainly underestimated. The good news is that pollution can be eliminated and pollution prevention can be cost effective. So if we look at where deaths are occurring related to all forms of pollution, what you can see is the colors start from pale yellow going up to dark red is that India has among the highest deaths attributable to all forms of pollution. And I'm going to try to use examples from your country as much as I can during this talk. But I think we need to understand that even in developed countries, we still have issues about what we know of pollution. <coughs> so we know that women's health is extremely important and unique, and it's the focus of this conference. And we know that um, worldwide, there are more men than um, women, but many parts of the population, thank you, are predominantly women. And that as we all age, there are more women than men throughout the world. We know that the fertility rate has declined worldwide and that longevity has increased. And we also know that the health of women is not the same as men. We are really beginning to understand much more lately that different kinds of exposures have different effects on men than we do as women. Um, we also know that there are places in the world where women outnumber men. Um, it's very interesting, I think, that in the former 
Soviet Union, Russia, and much of the former Soviet Union, that is true. Um, that is not true in India, where we have approximately equal numbers. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the leading causes of death for women worldwide. And I think if you look at the, certainly the four top leading causes of death, whether we're looking at, um, um, for example, heart disease, uh, issues of strokes, um, lower respiratory infections, chronic obstructive lung disease, these are all health effects that are associated with environmental pollution of all kinds, as well as some of the diseases that are also important, but not among the top four or five. And we know that the environment has been shown to play a role in many of the leading causes of death. And we know that cardiovascular disease, which we often think about as a problem of men, is actually the number one killer of women worldwide. So overall, around the world, women tend to live longer than men. Um, that non-communicable diseases, I've already mentioned heart disease, but also cancer, obesity, and diabetes kill more women than men. And I think that it's important to understand that more than half of the deaths in India are due to chronic non-communicable diseases. And that many of the deaths in India are due to um, maternal, perinatal, and nutritional diseases as well. So if we look at some of the women's health statistics um, in India, we can see that girls tend to die more than, little girls tend to die more than boys. Um, and that India alone has accounted for over 20% of all uh, deaths of young children um, in the world. Um, Another thing, and I'm going to come back to the whole issue of obesity. We used to think obesity was a problem in only in the developed world, but in fact, women in India account for 5% of the global obesity rate. Breast cancer in India is increasing rapidly. India has more people with type 2 diabetes than any other nation, and the prevalence of urban women is higher than that of men. And that, um, and this is a growing concern, I think. But India has the greatest number of two-term births locally. One thing which I think is encouraging is that India has exclusive breastfeeding to 65% of the population. Now, a key recent understanding, I would say, is that a good start lasts a lifetime. And part of this is the uh, basis of a new paradigm called the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease of DOHA. We are understanding that what happens early in life sets the trajectory for the rest of your life. And while for quite a number of years I focused almost exclusively on what was happening during um, in utero life, the fetal period, embryo and fetal period, and the infantile period, we're now beginning to understand that preconception in both males and females is an extremely susceptible period that can again have lifelong impact. So when we talk about some of these lifelong impacts, I just want to give you an example when we talk about breast cancer. Um, NIEHS has been working very closely with the National Cancer Institute for over 15 years now looking at the issue of windows of susceptibility. And while we're certainly much of the focus has focused on what happened prenatally, issues of diet and obesity, um, exposure to different kinds of organochlorine pesticides and air pollution, we focused on pre-puberty as a uh, critical window of susceptibility, looking again at a variety of different kinds of exposure to including the perfluorinated compounds, which I'm not sure how, how widely spread they are in India, but they are becoming a universal problem in America where 99% of our population um, has demonstrated exposure to it. We're understanding that adolescence is a period of susceptibility. I think everyone has either been a teenager 
or have had teenagers that know that teenager is not a stable period of time. And that's both biologically and socially. We know that for the woman, pregnancy is a susceptible window. Again, when does the susceptibility have to do with when our bodies are rapidly growing and changing? That's when you have opportunities to impact the system. So a woman's body, as well as her developing uh, babies, but a woman's body is rapidly changing during pregnancy. And then we're beginning to understand that the menopausal transition and postmenopause is also a critical window of susceptibility. And we have many studies that we're funding looking at some of these issues. But with breast cancer growing dramatically in India, I wanted to just give you a couple of recent results from some of the studies that we're co um, conducting actually in our intramural program, where we uh, started a study called the NIDHS system study, where we recruited nearly 51,000 women who they did not have breast cancer, but they had sisters who had breast cancer. So we knew that they were at increased risk of developing breast cancer. We recruited these women from about 2004 to 2009. We have ethnic diversity in this population in that we have white Americans, African Americans, um, African Americans, and Hispanic Americans in the population. Unfortunately, we do not have many Asian women as well. But this study is a, at least a 10-year longitudinal study, and I would say that any time you start a longitudinal study like this, you may say 10 years, but we're not going to stop at the end of 10. Because the longer we follow a population, the more we can learn. But in this study, it really enables us to look not only at environmental contributors to breast cancer, but it also enables us to look at the genetic contributors as well. Nested within this study is what we call the two sister study. And these are women, again, when they were recruited, they didn't have cancer, but they asked their sisters who did have cancer, would they be willing to participate? And in many cases, they asked their mothers and their fathers if they were still alive, would they be willing to participate? So again, we have some very powerful opportunities to look, not only longitudinally, but at the genetics of, of the study. So some of the very recent findings that we're having to this is I'm going to stop a minute because we have an important announcement. Let's welcome our Minister to the United States of America. We have been traveling all the way from Park Place. And we are very grateful to humanity, taking all the trouble of traveling all the way. And we welcome you all. We all of us welcome with, uh, with love and affection for you. Thank you so much for being here. <coughs> Dr. Linda. Uh, she is the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. She is giving a keynote address. Well, welcome, Minister. We're very happy that you could be here and hear some more about the issue of how the environment impacts India, or in fact, women, especially women in India. But I wanted to make a point here talking about breast cancer that. We're, we're beginning to understand, I, I mentioned the issue of what happens early in life impacts the rest of your life, and we're understanding that physical activity is extremely important. And women who had more physical activity when they were young had a lower breast cancer risk. Another thing that we're beginning to understand is the importance of vitamin D, and I think many of you know how important it is related to visual health, cardiovascular health, intestinal health. What we're beginning to find that high levels of vitamin D are associated with a lower risk of breast cancer as well. Another thing, and this is something I'll come back to because it's important to understand, is that there are now two studies that have been published that show, and these are U.S. studies, that show that women who live in homes where they're using fireplaces, and fireplaces in the U.S. in most cases are just used for a little bit of warmth, they're not usually the main source, but we're finding that those women have an increased risk of breast cancer as well. So that points out the importance of household air pollution that I'm going to come back to. In the two sister study, we looked at young onset breast cancer, women who developed breast cancer before they entered puberty, found some specific genes that were associated with it. Some of these genes were you know, involved in genes like the estrogen 
receptive at the end of one and get the keys of mom and five of one throat faster and DNA repair. We're associated with um, early onset breast cancer. But none of them were explained by the effects in uh, genes in the mother. So again, the importance of the environment and what it's like. Another point I wanted to make was the whole issue of preeclampsia and preterm birth. And I mentioned that there are more preterm births in India than anywhere else in the world. So there are a number of prospective birth cohorts that we are following. And we're thinking, um, looking at um, differences in the role of inflammation. Now, I think many of you know that inflammation is deemed to show to play a huge role in diabetes and a huge role in cardiovascular disease and a huge role in cancer. And we're finding that inflammation may actually be playing a role in preterm and preeclampsia as well. We're finding that. PAH, which you're going to hear about more um, in this meeting as well, so we playing a certain role as well, as well as certain trace metals. Um, and in India, we found that our grantees studied a cohort of pregnant women in rural India, and they found that poor sanitation, and what I mean there is open defecation, is associated with increased risk of preterm best birth. And that was independent of a socioeconomic level of the women. Another women's issue I wanted to mention was endometriosis. This is a really a pretty um, life-altering health condition that affects nearly 200 million worldwide, and I would say that is a tremendous underestimate. Many women who have endometriosis do not realize that they have it. But different um, studies, both epidemiology studies and um, studies in laboratory animals as models, have shown that soy formula feeding to um, babies may increase their risk later on of um, endometriosis as well as exposure to the common um, contaminant uh, BPA, which was used to harden bottles of the United States paper industries and many other places. And also that um, kind of ubiquitous contaminant that nobody wanted but was produced industrially as a contaminant and, and now just a result of combustion uh, called uh, TCD or dioxin. Uh, we're understanding that endometriosis is often associated with fibroids, which are non-malignant tumors, but we're finding that women with endometriosis are at increased risk of um, ovarian uterus cancer and we're really looking at the role of different kind of chemicals that impact our hormone system in the pathogenesis of the Now I mentioned obesity before. Okay. So um, on your left is kind of just what's happened with obesity in the United States over the past 20 years. You can see that 20 or 25 years ago there was very little obesity and the time has gone on. We, the obesity has dramatically increased across the U.S. And as I said before, this is not a situation unique to the developing world. We are finding that obesity is increasing in low and middle income countries as well. And in fact, if you look at the obesity in children, and I've highlighted both the U.S. and India on this slide, what you can see is that the numbers are quite large as well. In the U.S., actually, right now in the U.S., um, over two-thirds of our adults are overweight or obese. And right now, our children are well over 20 percent are overweight or obese in the United States. These are huge proportions and don't go well for the future health of our population. But I think it's important to understand that obesity disproportionately affects more women um, than men. So, while only about 5.3 or 6% of women in, obesity, uh, in India are obese today, the, uh, those rates have increased by over 24%. And the obesity rates of women in India are higher than that of men. So women are at special risk here. And that what we're beginning to understand is that many endocrine disrupting compounds are the compounds that actually may contribute to obesity. So when we say, why are we fat? You know, I'm never gonna say to anyone, you don't 
don't have to exercise at all, and you can eat as much as you want. That's clearly an issue. But are we setting people up to be fat, in part because of exposure to certain kinds of chemicals, especially in life, early in life, and I should say there's now data related to obesity of parents before they even conceive their children and increased risk for those children, um, and, but also quite a number of different chemical exposures. Are we basically altering the set point for body weight, making it much harder for people to lose weight later on? Now, some of the things that determine our um, obesity and body weight are things that we're just really beginning to focus on, and that is the whole issue of the microbiome. And you probably didn't notice in one of those first slides where I said the microbiome is part of our environment. But you know, for so many years, we forget that there are over 10 times as many bacterial cells in our bodies as then there are human cells. And that's when people use that 10 times number, they're really just talking about their gut microbiome. But remember, you have bacteria, viruses, fungi on your skin, in all your orifices, in your gut, and the gut is not one microbiome. I mean, you have a different one in your mouth than you do in your stomach, than you do in your intestines, and so on. But we're beginning to understand that our microbiome, a healthy microbiome, is required for the health um, of, our, of all of us. We now know, for example, that a baby born by C-section has a different microbiome for up to two years that are being born vaginally because they're not exposed to that normal vaginal microbiome. We are understanding that the gut microbiome of, is, of the mother is associated with basically the weight and the gestational weight gain and metabolic biomarkers in, in pregnancy. Um, and again, many, many different kinds of environmental chemicals influence the composition of the microbiome. If you actually in experimental studies with animals, if you transplant a healthy microbiome into an obese animal, that animal will lose weight and become thinner. And if you take a thin out, if, you know, if you do the reverse, you take the healthy microbiome from a thin animal and put it into an obese animal, it will lose weight. So it works both ways. And there have been some very interesting studies that are being now done in humans as well. For example, showing how artificial sweeteners are altering our gut microbiome, and that in fact are predisposing to metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. In humans, and we have animal models of them as well. 